Hi, this is Josh with Resort TV One, and today we're going to bring you the third edition of our Thursday Thoughts series. We hope you enjoy the video. Please remember to leave us a like and a comment on the video, and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you haven't already done so. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. We're Resort TV One on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So, let's get started. And you can see, by the way, before we get started, that I have a new poster over here, and that is my... Um, Epcot, original Epcot 1982 poster. The 21st century begins October 1st. I'm super excited to have that in here. Uh, I'm hoping to add one over here on the other side eventually, but uh, I, I really like the addition of the Epcot poster because Epcot's one of my favorite parks, and we're going to be discussing that today. But before we get into that, uh, I want to say the reason we didn't have Thursday Thoughts last week was due to Halloween, and just uh, time in my schedule has been really, really limited lately with uh, things going on at my school. It's been a really, really awesome time. Amazing things are happening, but uh, really busy time as well for the next few weeks for me with a lot of different performances. So I may not use as many flashy graphics and videos in this one just because uh, uh, for sake of time and just so I can get some rest tonight. But I really wanted to get some of my thoughts out because I've been adding some things together in my mind and taking notes as I think of different things to discuss. So uh, hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, also I wanted to answer last week's question or two weeks ago actually the question the latest non-IP attraction to be added to Walt Disney World. So does anybody know the answer to that? We actually had several people guess. Several people guessed Expedition Everest. That's a great guess, but that actually wasn't it. A lot of people guessed Soarin' Over California. That actually wasn't it either. I believe Expedition Everest was added in 2006. Soarin' Over California was added in 2005, at least to Walt Disney World. And so uh, actually, the latest non-IP attraction, as far as I can tell, is Soarin' Around the World. And technically, I know that's still soaring, but it is a new attraction. The movements are different. The video is different. So I consider it a, a different attraction. Uh, so I think that that would be the latest non-IP attraction added to Walt Disney World. It opened uh, in June of 2016. So uh, just three years ago, three and a half years ago or so. So soaring around the world is the latest non-IP attraction. In, in other words, intellectual property doesn't involve um, characters or existing characters in that particular attraction. And it's done pretty well. So, uh, so there you go. And we're not going to go into the whole IP discussion uh, on this video. That's something we did last time. But uh, anyway, you can go back and watch Thursday Thoughts number two um, to get some more of my thoughts about IP in the parks. Uh, I, again, I don't think it's all bad, but I uh, just wanted to point out that Soaring Around the World was the last non-IP attraction at Walt Disney World. And so the first thing I want to discuss today on Thursday Thoughts is Christmas at the parks. Of course, uh, this is a very current topic because... The parks are being dressed and decked from head to toe in Christmas uh, decorations and beautiful displays, holiday displays and all the resorts mm -hmm. and just all around Walt Disney World. So it's pretty incredible, honestly, to see all those things happening throughout the parks. Um, however, um, you know, there's some things to discuss with that, because if you've been around and going to Walt Disney World for a long time, you'll notice that they've changed some of the things that they've done. And change is not a bad thing. Change can be really, really a good thing. Um, but, you know, there are some things that I think a lot of us hardcore fans probably miss a little bit. So uh, let's talk about some of those. First of all, has Disney cut back a little bit on holiday decorations? I would say mostly yes. In some ways, no. But mostly, yes, they have cut back on some things. And so if you think back to the 90s, uh, we had lots of different things in the 90s. First of all, it is still pretty amazing. There aren't very many places in the world that decorate as much as Walt Disney World. And I'm a huge fan of Christmas at the world. And so this is not a knock on Disney or anything. It's just me kind of thinking back, maybe being a little bit nostalgic about some of the things that used to be. And I trust Disney. They do a lot of great things. So I'm sure they'll start to bring things back uh, as, as time and budget allows. But one of the things that I really, really miss uh, in, in the heyday of Christmas and really the heyday of the parks, the 90s and the early 2000s uh, were really the heyday of the parks, especially Christmas at the parks. Uh, you know, things did start to slip a little bit, especially after 2001, uh, you know, when uh, people didn't travel as much after 9-11, security fears and all that kind of thing. So I know they had to cut back at that point uh, due to the lower crowds. But uh, with Christmas, the thing that I remember the most, first of all, was at Epcot, the lights of winter. That was absolutely breathtaking. And if you had ever seen that, uh, make sure you leave me a comment, and I will try and include an image of that or maybe a short video if I get a chance here uh, up in the corner of the screen. So hopefully I get a chance to do that. But Lights of Winter was an absolutely incredible, incredible experience at Epcot. And I remember going there for the first time. I was in high school, I think, 1995. So there you go. You can figure out how old I am. But um, I was 
you know, we went to Epcot, uh, you know, my whole family was there, Jenna was there along, you know, along with everybody else. And uh, I just remember being absolutely in awe of the Lights of Winter. It was breathtaking. The music is amazing. And actually, I do have a copy of that. And I believe I posted it uh, on our Patreon page. And, and maybe I can post it elsewhere, too. But it's a beautiful music loop, first of all. Uh, symphonic, orchestral, Christmas music. But what's really cool about it was these lights, they were big archways uh, of lights that would dance with the music. Now, of course, later on, the Osborne lights at Hollywood Studios, which we'll talk about a little bit later, had that same type of a technology. But in 1995-96, dancing lights were fairly a new thing. So, you know, to me, that was just incredible that these archways lit up. And where they had them was uh, between basically where Interventions Plaza was and the World Showcase uh, kind of gateway area there, the, the entry point to World Showcase, the entry plaza. So that little bridge that runs along kind of between Odyssey and the Imagination Pavilion uh, was where that was. And, um, as you walked through there, you were greeted with these archways, beautiful lights, colors, and sounds. Music was piped all the way through that whole area. But what was even more incredible was not only was it synced up with the lights, it was also synced up with the Fountain of Nations. And so the Fountain of Nations would go, you know, all kinds of different beautiful dancing jets of water with the uh, gateway uh, arches there with the lights of winter. So it's just absolutely incredible to see all those things. It was like a larger than life show. And especially in the nineties when that was really, um, you know, going strong, it was just an incredible piece of technology and showmanship that Disney had that really put them above anywhere else. So um, that was something that I really enjoyed. Uh, leave me a comment. If you remember the lights of winter, uh, I heard they had some problems with it and some malfunctions. So definitely, um, you know, I think they had some issues that they weren't able to rectify and they just decided to go ahead and uh, scrap that. But uh, it was pretty amazing. Okay, we had to take just a little bit of a break there to fix an issue with the audio sync. I'm hoping I can fix it in the post-production, but I got quite a bit of the video finished and uh, I don't want to rehash all those thoughts and uh, miss something. So I do apologize if the audio is out of sync, but I'm having to use a different app now because I was really struggling with my webcam and my mic to get it all to line up. So everything looks like it's lined up now, but uh, didn't really notice that earlier. So hopefully it stays lined up now. Uh, anyway, I was talking about the lights of winter. Um, and uh, I wanted to also mention the Fountain of Nations, like I said, was synced up with the Lights of Winter. Uh, but we really, really miss the, the Fountain of Nations around Christmas time now here at Epcot because even with the Lights of Winter gone, the Fountain of Nations actually still played that, or they still played that Lights of Winter loop around the Fountain of Nations Plaza there at Epcot. And they uh, still did the Dancing Fountains, even though the archways were gone. So uh, we're going to miss that this year with the Fountain of Nations completely gone. Uh, and from the monorail, we, we showed you on an update a couple weeks ago that it is completely torn out. So definitely going to miss that. I'm very sad that that's not going to be a thing this year uh, to watch the Fountain of Nations and uh, that, that Lights of Winter Loop. So I hope that they can bring it back somewhere. Maybe they'll play it in the plaza anyway, which would still be nice. But uh, no fountain this year for sure. So hopefully they'll do something else there to uh, add Christmas spirit to the area, to, to the area of Walcott, as we call it. Uh, and also Osborne lights. That was a big, big thing, you know, back in the uh, in the late 90s and then uh, most of the 2000s until they just recently took it out to uh, get ready, of course, and make way for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And while I love Galaxy's Edge, I really miss New York Street and I really miss, um, you know, the uh, Osborne lights that were there. And a lot of you may or may not remember this, but there was a uh, back lot streets where they had kind of residential streets like the Golden Girls house was there, uh, Empty Nest house was there and things like that. That was on the original back lot studio tour. And so uh, they actually put the original Osborne light collection on those houses and they just decorated those houses basically from you know from floor to ceiling all the way uh, or floor to roof i should say all the way around that whole residential street and then they opened up and uh, they discontinued the tram service and opened up the road so we could just walk through there and enjoy with christmas music so that was pretty cool i remember that uh, i believe that was probably more of in the mid 90s when that was happening uh, and then later on they started adding them to new york street when they took out the residential street area uh, to accommodate the um, what they call it, the Lights, Motors, Action stunt show. So uh, anyway, eventually, of course, the uh, the Osborne lights that most people know and love uh, from the past were uh, on New York Street and uh, the different uh, streets of America, whatever you want to call it, uh, there in um, 
in Hollywood studios. And it was incredible. Uh, all the canopies uh, over the over the street and uh, all the different music that they would use, the little radio station that they'd use. Phineas and Ferb would be on there and just different Disney characters and Disney shows. And it was a lot of fun. They did a great job with it. There were so many things. You could walk around for hours and see something new every single time. Um, you know, it was just a really, really neat display. Uh, they had lights and different uh, tributes to different religions. You know, they had a manger scene there, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, and just, you know, a lot of really neat things that, that you could uh, that you could enjoy. And, and of course, that one of the games that you used to be able to play was Counting Hidden Mickey. So, uh, you know, that was something, uh, it was just a lot of fun. It was a great attraction. Uh, you know, some people might say it was a little gaudy. It was a little overboard, uh, almost like Christmas exploded, I think is what my wife said one time. And, and that is absolutely true. Um, you know, it was a little bit over the top, but it was really fun. And uh, we used to do it every Christmas Eve, actually. We'd open presents, uh, some presents on Christmas Eve. And then we once we moved down here, we would go out there uh, to uh, the Osborne Lights and just have a great time. And Christmas Eve, it was usually not very busy. The crowd seemed to come in a lot of times after Christmas, at least in years past. People would spend Christmas at home and then come to Disney in that week between uh you know, the 26th and uh, all the way down to uh, New Year's was the busiest week. So now it's kind of busy the whole time. But uh, it used to be you could go New Year's Eve and there, or sorry, uh, Christmas Eve and there weren't hardly any people there. So really miss the Osborne Lights. Uh, my question is, and this is, let me see what you guys think about this. Again, leave me a comment. This video is interactive, by the way. Uh, we want you guys to leave comments. I want to read them, respond, uh, and I'm trying to respond to more each week. I think I got 80 or 90 of them answered last week. I'm going to get more this week. Um, and so hopefully I can respond to more comments comments than what we're able to do on the live streams. But make sure, leave me a comment, let me know, do you think that they should put the Osborne lights back in somewhere else? And if so, where? Where, the, where should they put it? Uh, it's kind of a difficult thing. Obviously, they can't put it you know, in Galaxy's Edge. It wouldn't fit the theming at all. Uh, obviously, they can't put it you know, in... Um, they can't put it really in World Showcase. That would kind of uh, defeat the theming of some of the buildings there. Uh, I guess maybe they could put it uh, elsewhere in Hollywood Studios on the main uh, street there, uh, Hollywood Boulevard. But I don't think they want they don't want to clog up all the traffic there. They could put it on Sunset Boulevard, maybe. Uh, you know, it really wouldn't fit the theming of Animal Kingdom. So. Uh, uh, Magic Kingdom, of course, is out because uh, there's just not a good area there. So let, let me know what you think. Or should they build a whole new area just for that, that they could maybe put another attraction in somewhere with the you know kind of streets of a certain city and they could, uh, during Christmas season, they could use that uh, for the Osborne Lights. So let me know what you think uh, in the comments down below. I'd love to know. And also uh, at Magic Kingdom, another Christmas um, tradition that was there that I think a lot of people miss, and I certainly miss, is the Main Street garlands. They used to stretch all the way from one side to the other on Main Street USA. And this is a really special thing for me because when I was a kid, uh, the town we grew up in in, Indi in in Indiana had garlands all the way down their Main Street. It was a very traditional Main Street uh, for a kind of a small town. Uh, it was pretty long. I think it was probably uh, the, the main uh, drag, as you would call it, with all the businesses and all the stoplights and kind of the busy area. I think it was maybe eight blocks long, eight to ten blocks long or more. It was pretty long for a main street on a town that wasn't that big. Uh, but they had garlands all the way down with lights and bells. And it was just so cool as a kid to drive down there or to ride down with mom and dad and just kind of enjoy that. They played Christmas music up and down the streets. And so, you know, it was really neat to grow up in a town like that. And then when I first went to Disney World at Christmas, I believe was in, like I said, 95, 97, I think it was 95. I was just blown away by Magic Kingdom at Christmas. First of all, they used to put a real... Christmas tree, uh, a real evergreen tree uh, there at, at uh, Main Street USA. So they weren't able to put it up uh, right there in Town Square. They weren't able to put it up until uh, you know a couple weeks before Christmas because they didn't want it to dry out and be unsafe. Uh, maybe it was beginning of December or maybe a couple weeks before anyway. So actually, I, I, you know, I, I'm okay with the fact that they're using an artificial tree, but it was kind of cool that they had a big tree there. I, I will say that did bother me a little bit that they'd cut down uh, such a huge tree. So I'm okay with that, but it is something just so you know uh, the tradition used to be to use a real Christmas tree. The good news is with the artificial tree, it still looks amazing, and they're able to put it up right at the beginning of the season. So that, that works out really, really well. But the garlands... I kind of digress here. The garlands over Main Street USA were amazing, very similar to what I described in my hometown. Uh, there were lights all around them. I believe there were Mickey wreaths in the middle. I'll have to go look up a picture. Maybe I can put one up here uh, on the stream and or on the video just to show you uh, exactly uh, what they used to look like. I think there were Mickeys in the middle. I'll have to look it up. But anyway, uh, the reason they had to remove those was actually because Maleficent uh, in, the, um, in the afternoon parade uh, Maleficent actually uh, is too tall, especially when she raises her head. And then, of course, there were concerns about the breathing fire and everything else. Maleficent was way too tall. 
And so what ended up happening was they went to these wreaths that kind of stick out from, you know, from either side of Main Street, kind of come in from the sides like this, but they don't actually go all the way across. So you get these nice little wreaths with the little hangers on them, and that's great. But the problem is, you know, it doesn't quite have the same effect as the garland all the way across the street. The other reason I heard for them being taken out was because it did block the view of the fireworks for some people. So you had to kind of be between the garlands to see the fireworks a little bit. Um, and so, you know, you, you wouldn't want to stand in a certain area. It would really block your view of uh, either, you know, um, the Christmas fireworks show, which I guess is Minnie's uh, Christmas Spectacular or something at, at which this year, which will be new. We'll show that uh, actually tomorrow. So that'll be really, really cool. So don't miss that on our live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, or Happily Ever After, of course, is still the regular show for most of the Christmas season, uh, not during the party. So anyway, uh, I, I know that's why they probably removed the garlands, but uh, I do still miss them. It was very, very festive to see that. I think I've seen pictures Disneyland Paris does still use them, so that's pretty cool. Um, so also, uh, decorations in other lands in Magic Kingdom. They used to have decorations more in Liberty Square. Even at the Christmas shop, of course, is always decorated year-round. But they used to have decorations all through Liberty Square. Uh, they had some in Frontierland, I remember. Uh, and they used to have, uh, you know, just more throughout Fantasyland, Tomorrowland, everything else. And they've really scaled that back throughout the last few years. Uh, so I hope that they will bring some of that back. I really think that it's nice for the parks to be as festive as possible uh, in all the different areas. Now, they do a great job in a lot of the resorts. Uh, a lot of the resorts are really, really well decorated. Of course, they've got the Gingerbread House and the Polynesian, uh, not the Polynesian, sorry, the Gingerbread House and the Grand Floridian. Uh, they've got the island theme. They used to do the uh, island themed kind of Gingerbread House uh, competition with the cast members there. I think they still do at Polynesian. Uh, but then they also have, um, you know, the uh, Chocolate Carousel at, uh, at Beach Club and, and, and all kinds of things. That Boardwalk has uh, the, the nice uh, Chocolate Village or uh, Gingerbread Village that they show. And, and uh, Yacht Club has the really, really cool um, Christmas Village with the train set around it. So there's a lot of really, really neat decorations throughout the different parks um, but or, and throughout the resorts, mm -hmm. I should say. But I really think that um, it really is, you know, is great if they would actually add more to some of the areas, even the value resorts, maybe add some uh, flagship uh, types of displays where you say, okay, you know, uh, Art of Animation now has a flagship display and not just a Christmas tree. Um, you know, so I know that costs money, but I think, like we talked about on the last Thursday Thoughts, that video, or sorry, those types of touches actually really mm -hmm. add to the Disney magic. So and I think another thing that's been scaled back a little bit is the landscaping. Uh, and I'll have to check Magic Kingdom when we go back uh, tomorrow for the party. But they used to do these really cool uh, displays of poinsettias everywhere. There were these amazing, like almost a sea of poinsettias in the different planners and displays right around the hub. And that was just incredible to see. So I'll have to uh, check and see if they put those back in. But even in Epcot, in different places, uh, of course, Epcot doesn't have a lot of planners in the front now with the uh, construction going on. But they really used to do a lot more with the landscaping. They also used to have these really cool poinsettia trees and those have been cut way back too so uh, we'll see if they are able to bring some of that back and uh, you know just really make the holiday special like I was I was saying earlier that the little touches are really what set Disney apart from everywhere else and I think that uh, they really need to keep going that extra mile it's not because they have to it's because you know they're Disney so Disney always does that extra and that's what makes it special so hopefully they continue to remember that and bring a little bit more of the holidays back leave me a comment let me know what you think obviously I, I still love the holidays at Walt Disney World it's like nowhere else on earth I'm excited to go to Disneyland in a couple weeks to check out their holiday decorations but uh, yeah, I still miss some of the things from the past. And, uh, you know, that's a common thread, I think, from a lot of us that have been going for a while. Now, I'm not super negative about it. Uh, you know, like some people get very upset about it. I'm just more uh, a little bit wistful about it, I guess, and, and hoping and, and uh, really uh, wishing that they would bring some of it back. So we'll see what happens. But leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. And then the next one is uh, about uh, that we're going to discuss is about original Epcot and the wow factor. And one of the things I think that does set Disney apart from other theme parks and uh, other attractions around the world is that wow factor that you come into when you see uh, a Disney attraction for the first time. See, I told you these videos were going to be raw and unedited at the very beginning, so I noticed I still had my headphones in because I was checking audio uh, when the audio was messed up in the earlier part of the video. So uh, I hope you'll forgive me for all the errors. I hope you still enjoy listening, but uh, I'm on a little bit of a short time schedule tonight, so I do apologize if the quality takes a little bit of a hit today. But uh, anyway, let's get back into the discussion of the wow factor. Uh, one of the things that I love about going to Disney World and seeing an attraction for the first time is when I just get that sense of awe and just 
just knowing how much care, love, and just attention to detail the Imagineers put into that attraction. And uh, it, it's really awe-inspiring to see when something, a ride is basically created or an attraction is created that's a true masterpiece. And, uh, you know, some attractions are that way and some are not. So I'm excited to see the rise of the resistance here in a few weeks. I have a feeling that that is going to be classed as a masterpiece and I'm going to have that awe moment. And it can't ever be duplicated. You can't ever ride an attraction for the first time ever again. So leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about that, about that wow factor, that riding it for the first time. You can only do it once and it's a very special moment. I did have that wow factor, I will say, when I rode Flight of Passage. I think most people did. Soren, I remember the first time I rode Soren over California. I just sat there with my mouth open and when my mouth wasn't just wide open like in you know it was more of also just a smile like just appreciation for the masterpiece that had been created uh, but going back to original epcot uh, you know that happened so much more with the original epcot attractions they were so bold and they were just so fresh and new something that never been done before and, and you know you get the you, get, you would get that wow factor almost every time you rode them and especially the first time i don't remember unfortunately the first time i rode some of those attractions because it was so long ago but i remember being a kid and just riding them at different points in my life and and just being in awe of course we always talk about horizons um and really with Epcot itself, going back to Epcot for just a second, there really still is nothing like Epcot in the world. And I think that's really special. You know, there's not a place where it's kind of a world expo plus kind of the futuristic, the technology and all that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, some of that is going away a little bit with a lot of the intellectual property that's been added to Future World. But uh, and I know there's going you know, to be new names for all the areas of Future World now. But I think still there's nothing like it in the world. It's still a really special place, and it will continue to be a really special place. But when you talk about a ride like Horizons, uh, that was a masterpiece. There's no way around it. And if you haven't seen it, there's a video of it on our channel. Um, definitely go check it out. It's courtesy of one of our um, one of our friends, Al C, who made the video. He didn't have a YouTube channel and allowed me to put it up. Uh, it's incredible. The ride was awe-inspiring and, and it's not it's not like one of these kind of hit you in the face kind of attractions like a roller coaster or, or you know like um, a thrill ride of any kind or something like that where it's super fast or it gets you really wet or it, you know makes you really scared or whatever it's not like that it, it gives you that sense of awe but you have to you know you had to take time to really appreciate and enjoy it and as a kid I guess I did have the patience to do that um, plus you know that technology was so new when they had the uh, the Omnimax screen in the middle of horizons had that 90 foot theater screen screen there it just really um, left you in awe I'd never seen anything that big before it was a huge seamless projection screen um, and the the ride vehicles kept moving through that um, through that area and all of a sudden you know you would see this rocket blasting off it was a space you know space shuttle blasting off uh, and it was almost uh, you know not of course not quite but it was it felt like it was life-size and the vehicle would shake and I mean as a kid that was just incredibly powerful and then the music, the score to that attraction was so epic. So, you know, those are the things that gave you those awe moments every time that you wrote it. And you thought, wow, somebody really loved what they were doing so much to just put so much of their heart and soul into something. And, and I'm not saying that's not done today, but I think there are less attractions like that today than there used to be. Uh, and so I'm hoping that they bring some of that back. And like I said, Rise of the Resistance has a lot of promise. World of Motion was another one. You could ride that attraction so many times and see something new every single time. It was one of our mom's favorite attractions, uh, especially the scene, if you remember in there. And again, there's videos of that on our channel as well. If you go back through and, and watch that video, there's a scene in the middle of the ride where uh, like all transportation goes bonkers and like it's like basically in the middle of a downtown area and everything's crashed and there's a complete traffic jam, uh, just this horrible event. But it's hilarious because everybody's kind of squawking. The chickens are squawking. Everybody's yelling at each other and trying to figure out what to do to get it moving. The police officers that are there didn't know what was going on. And it's just kind of funny to ride through that uh, confusing scene. And you can you can ride through there. And see something different every time. Uh, and so, of course, Test Track is a great attraction, but World of Motion just had something special. Uh, it used a really cool Pepper's Ghost effect, which is what they use in Haunted Mansion to show, you know, the ghosts uh, at the end or in the middle in the ballroom scene. Uh, but Haunted Mansion, sorry, so um, World of Motion actually used that Pepper's Ghost effect on your vehicle to make your vehicle look like this futuristic car. Basically, in that point, it was a 2000s car. So now here we are in 2019. So, you know, the, the projections for the future weren't entirely accurate, but some of the 
cars now, especially the Teslas, look pretty similar uh, to those projections for what those futuristic cars would look like. So, you know, Epcot got a lot of things right. Um, you know, Imagination, the original journey into imagination was so incredible. Um, Figment was amazing in that one. And uh, it was just so much fun. It was very childlike, innocent, but also just kind of showed you what imagination could do if it was used to its fullest potential. And again, riding that attraction, you just saw the love and care the Imagineers put into it. Uh, and just really, um, there was no detail left out. Um, there was nothing spared in the budget, it seemed like. Everything was just really maximized and, and incredible. Uh, and of course, when they redid it, uh, you know, it really wasn't as good. And, and it's, it's a little bit better now. But uh, that brings me to my next point. I really, really hope that even though they've got plans for a lot of the other pavilions at Epcot to give them a, uh, you know, a little bit of TLC or to give them complete overhauls in the next few years, I'm glad to see a lot of that. However, I really hope they give some love to imagination eventually, because I really think that there could be some great things done there. And I think they could really explore imagination in a lot more productive way, as opposed to just kind of going through sight tense, or sight, uh, you know, sense of smell, touch, you know, whatever else. I, I feel like that's more, uh, you know, the sight and, you know, sense of smell and everything. That's more observation than anything else. I don't feel like that is a, you know, imagination. I guess uh, imagination can work through the senses, but I feel like uh, there needs to be a little bit better and deeper exploration of that and imagination is what disney's all about so you really think that should be kind of a flagship pavilion so leave me a comment let me know what are your ideas for the imagination pavilion what would you do uh, if you had to redesign it how would you do it obviously figment has to be a part of it we want figment in there he's one of the best uh original theme park characters really in the world um and so you know figment has got to stay but you know what would we do and what would you do with that leave a comment and let me know uh, and let's talk a little bit more about Epcot. One of the other things I mentioned was the festivals at Epcot are great. Food and Wine Festival is a lot of fun. I know it's necessary to bring in the crowds, but uh, what else can we do with that? You know, what else could be done with the festival? I feel like there are some other avenues that could be explored with these different uh, festivals. You know, Festival of the Holidays is coming up. Again, it, it's a reason for them to leave the booths up and, uh, you know, keep that moving in the right direction and, and not have to keep you know, putting the booths in and out and deconstructing them, reconstructing. Some of them are almost permanent now. But, and I know they make a lot of money off the food and I understand why it's necessary. But uh, at the same time, you know, what else could be done with that to make it more, even more international, more authentic? Maybe uh, adding an attraction that goes with that somehow. Uh, maybe using the the World Showplace area around uh, between the United Kingdom and Canada, where uh, actually they do special events there. Uh, you know, what else could they do? Just let me know in the comments with the festivals. And are you okay with all the festivals, uh, or do you think it's too much? You know, we've got. Um, the uh, you know festival of the arts in the spring we've got food and wine festival you know we've got festival of the holidays uh, just so many different things and of course flower and garden festival I almost forgot that one so there's basically a festival at Epcot all year is that too much or uh, maybe should they should just do something different with it let me know um, and also as far as the new attractions go. Do you think that there should be or there will be educational aspects? I guess I feel like there there should be. Do you think there will be educational aspects to the new attractions that are going in at Epcot? You know, the uh, the water attraction that's going to kind of feature Moana. Do you think there will be educational features to that, even if they're using Moana to help educate and get the children, you know, get kids interested or even adults interested in learning about maybe water conservation or things like that? Uh, do you think there'll be those aspects or do you think it'll be mostly the entertainment angle? Uh, you know, living uh, the Seas with Nemo and Friends, I still call it the Living Seas, but the Seas with Nemo and Friends does have a lot of educational aspects to it. Uh, you can go in there and learn about sharks. You can learn about conservation of manatees. Uh, you can learn about all kinds of different conservational and, uh, and biological things in there, which is great. I think it's a really great use of the space and using the characters to educate people. I'm all for that. I don't have any issue with adding that in to make it more interesting for people as long as it still maintains that educational aspect. Um, I think imagination is less educational than it used to be, for sure. So that we, we you know, that can be, uh, there can be more done with that. Uh, as far as uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I'm not sure how they could add any kind of educational aspect because this is really just kind of, um, you know, it's kind of a fun type of a thing. It's kind of a for fun space thing. So you've got mission space that does a little bit. It's educational as far as how uh, astronauts are trained and how we might, uh, you know, how uh, how it is to live inside of a, you know, a, a 
capsule that that flies out into space and things like that or a deep space uh, how a deep space flight might be so that that's kind of cool and there is some educational aspect to that test track has some educational aspect to it with the uh, design of a car how aerodynamics and how uh, different uh, parts of the car play in together to make a really successful award-winning design so that's really cool too but I'm, I'm questioning how Guardians of the Galaxy is going to be educational. Uh, you know, will they use different aspect, aspects from the solar system, or will it just be, hey, look, here's a really fun ride, and it's a roller coaster? So I don't know. What do you think? Leave me, leave me some comments. And Disney, if you're watching, uh, let's let's find a way to tie that into the educational nature of Epcot. I still think it needs to retain that. I think that was the the goal from the very beginning, that edutainment thing. I think that's what sets a Disney and Epcot specifically apart from any other theme park anywhere. You know, it sets it apart from a Six Flags or even from a Universal. Uh, to some extent, you know, Universal is great, but they don't do a lot of uh, educational type things. So let's, uh, you know, let's see if we can keep that in there somehow. Um, and also, you know, I talked before about the music, but music is a huge part of these attractions, especially at Epcot. There's been so much great music originally composed for Epcot attractions, uh, so much so that I think a lot of us big theme park fans, especially from the 90s, we still listen to a lot of that stuff on our iPhones and in our cars and things like that. So, um, you know, what do you think about the original music for these attractions? I mean, it's, it's got to me, it's got to be original. Um, and that's why I think a lot of us like these original attractions like Horizons and things like that. Um, I think Disney could come up with something else. And I think, uh, I hope with Spaceship Earth, that is still a non-IP attraction. I hope they come up with a fantastic original score for it, use some amazing new technology. And, uh, you know, I hope that they uh, make it really amazing. So... So that's about it for the discussion on Epcot and how it used to be and maybe the directions for it. Leave me some comments. Let me know what you think about any and all of the things that I talked about. You know, do you agree, disagree? Uh, it, you know, it's okay to disagree, obviously. Uh, you know, we're all going to have different opinions. I think it's great to read different opinions. You might post something I didn't think about. So I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm just one person. Um, but we do uh, have one more thing I want to talk about before we wrap up this edition of Thursday Thoughts. Straws and lids. I know this is kind of a, a short thing and it may be a little bit, uh, you know, maybe not as important um, as as some of the other things that we've talked about. Um, but it is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot. And just with some of the things, Disney has been doing some things to save money. And I get that. I guess I'd rather them save money on straws and lids and do better attractions. So, you know, I, I do get that as long as the money does go in or maybe paying cast members better. I think everybody's in favor of that um, because they do cast members work so hard to create the magic. So I think everybody's in agreement about those things. Um, my issue is, you know, as, as a parent, you know, taking Liam to the parks, um, you know, I, I really could use a lid. Uh, we don't usually get him, you know, soda or anything like that. We usually just bring our own uh, beverages for him. So we're not as concerned. He's got his, uh, you know, his cups that he drinks out of that don't spill. So that's not an issue. But the issue is, you know, if I'm getting a Coke and then my hand, I need my hands free uh, to help Liam or to push the stroller, you know, I can't put a Coke uh, without a lid in the stroller and then go over bumps. It just splashes everywhere. Even if you drink it down, it splashes everywhere. It needs that lid on it. And I've asked that last couple times in the parks, hey, can I have a lid uh, at some of the restaurants? And they're like, oh, no, we don't have any anymore, or it's only for children's drinks. So if I got a lid for Liam, it would be okay. But for me, it's not okay, even though I really would like to do it. So what I've found myself having to do, unfortunately, is uh, is finish the drink there in the restaurant and not take it with me and not get the refill. So I guess maybe they're saving money on that too. And again, it's a small thing. I get it. Um, you know, it's not a big deal, kind of a... Um, kind of a first world problem, I guess you could say, but it's one of those things that to me, um, if they put the lids back, I just don't know how much of an environmental impact or a cost saving impact that's really having. Um, especially maybe if they didn't put them out there, maybe if you had to request them, but they were able to give them to people. Uh, maybe I just got the wrong cast member a couple times when I asked and, and maybe other cast members would help, but, um, that's just been kind of an inconvenience for me the last couple uh, couple weeks and couple months that I've been at, at, at the parks. I also noticed that they used to have straws but no lids. They used to have the paper straws. A lot of people didn't like them. Personally, I didn't mind them. I thought they were better than nothing. But now those have kind of gone away in most places. I think you can get them in um, a few places. But I, I just haven't seen them in uh, most of the parks and in most of the major restaurants in the parks. So... Uh, what do you think about the straws and the lids going away? Is it not a big deal to you? You're like, you know, whatever, let's save the money on the parks. Let's, or are you more of a, on the 
on the thought process of let's save the environment. This is a really good thing for the environment. Or are you more like me where I'm like, hey, let's bring this back. I don't think it's that big of an impact. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm all wrong on that, but I feel like the cups would have a lot bigger impact uh, on the environment than just the straws and the and the lids. And of course, I know they can't take away the cups, but maybe there's some other things that b can be done. Uh, maybe they could go to a plastic cup uh, that could be recycled and they could have a special trash can for those. They already do, but they could really encourage people to, to put the plastic cups in the trash so they could be recycled. Maybe that would have less of an impact. I'm not sure. So let me know what you think in the comments. Um, you know, the other thing I thought about, too, is, um, you know, all these uh, cups and lids and different things are being thrown into plastic trash bags and then they're being, you know, dumped in wherever Disney does their central trash, um, you know, depository. So I'm just wondering, having the lids in there, having the straws in there. Uh, I just, I'm not sure how big of a difference it makes because they're already going into plastic trash bags. So they're already not going to decompose quite as easily. So I do think there needs to be some things done and some advances made in that area, but not sure how much that particular thing helps. So uh, let me know what you think. I could be all wrong on this one. So, and I don't want to be anti-environmentally friendly. We do recycle at home. Um, I, every time I have a place to recycle uh, my Coke can or my water bottle or whatever, I definitely, you know, find that place at Disney. I'll walk past a trash can to go to the recycle. And that's not to say I'm this wonderful recycling person. That's just how I feel. I feel like I, I, I want to do that. It's a small thing I can do to help. But um, the straws and lids, I'm just not sure how much it helps. So, uh, And let's talk about what we're going to do next week. I've had some viewer requested uh, conversations. We're going to try and get to some of those. So leave me a comment. Let me know if there's something you'd like me to discuss on the next Thursday Thoughts. Also, uh, I'm going to talk about Disney+. Plus. That was one thing that was requested, and I didn't have time to gather enough information about that for this week. But uh, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about Disney+, Plus, and I can start discussing that for next week. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to try it when it comes out. Um, but I can also discuss it a little bit and just some of my thoughts behind uh, Disney having this huge streaming service that's set to launch here pretty soon. So uh, let me know what you think. And uh, again, just let me know what you think about these videos. I I'm sorry if the quality suffered a little bit on this one. I don't unfortunately have time to re-record any of the segments where the uh, audio sync was bad or anything like that. But hopefully you still enjoyed. And, um, you know, just remember to leave that like because it really does help the video. Share us out. Uh, if you're enjoying any and all of our videos, make sure you remember tomorrow, which will be Friday, um, we are going to be doing the very first Mickey's Very Merry Christmas Party with the brand new fireworks show. Uh, we'll have the, the parade, uh, all kinds of different things to show, all the treat spots, uh, and just uh, showing you how to enjoy your time, how to maximize your time at this amazing Christmas party at the Magic Kingdom. So that'll be the very first party of 2019 tomorrow, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Do not miss it. Uh, it's going to be a pretty epic night, and we can't wait for you to be a part of it as well. So uh, we'll see you then. Again, um, make sure you're subscribed, hit the notification bell. Don't forget all those things. It really does help uh, you to stay connected with us when you do that. Follow us on social media. We're Resort TV One on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, please check out our sponsors, mickeyblog.com and mickeytravels.com for the best in free Disney vacation planning advice. Go check out mickeytravels.com to book your next trip to Disney. It doesn't cost any more than a regular Disney vacation at mickeytravels.com. Also, be sure to check out uh, Victor Naraki at CelebratingFlorida.com or Facebook.com slash Naraki Realtor if you're thinking about moving to Central Florida. He's a realtor who specializes in the Disney World area, and he would love to help you find your dream home uh, in the uh, Disney World area. And he will help you match your budget as well as any of your other needs, schools, and things like that. He'll help you find your dream home here in the Walt Disney World area. So go CelebratingFlorida.com or Facebook.com slash Naraki Realtor. So for now... Have a great big beautiful tomorrow. Bye bye. Now that you've finished watching this video, be sure that you're subscribed so that you can get all of the latest updates. Also, check out some other great videos on our channel. Have a great big beautiful tomorrow. Bye bye.